This is our third generation Toyota 4Runner. It's an amazing vehicle. The last of the truly compact 4Runners, it is the swan song of what made Toyota such a magical brand for compact pickups and SUVs in the 1980s and 1990s. When we bought this rig in 2017, a good four-wheel drive third gen 4Runner could be had for $5,000 or less. We paid just a hair over that, but I was more than happy to considering this 4Runner only had 110,000 miles on the clock. Nowadays, things have changed. With the resurgence and in interest of all things outdoors related, a lot of people have got the overlanding bug, and that's great. But at the same time, a lot of us have had to tighten our belts and can't really justify the expense of even a $10,000 vehicle to pursue our outdoors dreams. To add further insult, the prices of reliable, decent overlanding rigs has started to go through the roof. Decent examples of what used to be reliable overlanding rigs five years ago, time-tested favorites like Jeep XJs and third-gen 4Runners will all put you well over that mark now. So what do you do if you have a certain dream overlanding vehicle, but the current market conditions are pricing you out of the game? Well, today I'm gonna give you five alternatives to some commonly sought after rigs you can pick up today for under $5,000. Now, before I get into this list, it is worth noting there are risks to buying a used car, especially at this price point. I suggest you research the heck out of any vehicle you are seriously considering buying, and it wouldn't hurt to have an independent mechanic take a look at it before you hand over the cash, just to minimize the chance of any surprises. Now, with that being said, we're going to make things a little more interesting. We actually did purchase one of the vehicles on this list. Stick around to the end to find out more. The Toyota Tacoma Alternative, third gen Ford Ranger or Mazda B Series pickup truck. I had a 2002 Tacoma when I was a younger man. It is literally the only vehicle in my entire life I have ever regretted selling. Especially now when you take a look at where prices for good examples of first generation Tacomas have went. Let's face it, you're not going to find a four-wheel drive in anything resembling decent condition for under $5,000. It's just not going to happen. Fortunately, there is the 1998 to 2012 third generation Ford Ranger and Mazda B series pickup. This baby, like the first gen Tacoma, is the end of an evolutionary cycle that started in the 1980s and ended in the new millennium with a damn near perfect pickup truck. They were sold in a whole slew of options and powertrains, from two-wheel drive and four-cylinders to four-wheel drive V6s, with the four-wheel drive step sides being some of the coolest looking pickup trucks from that era, in my humble opinion. They were rugged, reliable, and Ford sold a boatload of them. Like, it was the best-selling compact pickup truck from 1987 to 2004. So there's more than a few of them around. Also. It was rebadged and sold by Mazda as the B-Series, meaning there's even more of them around. And it's that commonality which is its strength. For me, its biggest limitation is cab sizes. It was only ever offered in the US in single and extended cab versions, the latter really being a place to put more stuff that you just didn't want in an open exposed bed in the back. Not really a viable option if you need to haul around more than one full-size adult. The 80 and 100 Series Land Cruiser Alternative second and third generation Mitsubishi Monteros. Maybe you're someone who dreams of owning an 80 or 100 series Toyota Land Cruiser. But realize you're gonna have to pony up some serious cash to get one in anything that resembles decent condition? Well, that's okay. Mitsubishi's got an answer for you. Back in the era, when the most visible Toyota Land Cruisers in the world were the white ones hauling UN inspectors around looking for Saddam's WMDs, well, 
Just on the other side of the Suez, the Mitsubishi Pajero was ripping up the Sahara Desert in a little event called the Dakar Rally, winning 11 times between 1992 and 2007. We actually got the Pajero in the United States, only it was rebadged and sold to soccer moms as the Montero. The second generation models feature body on frame construction, independent front suspension, and a coil sprung live rear axle with some option even with a locking rear differential. The third generation was a unibody design with front and rear independent suspension. Gone was the optional rear locker. Instead, some models actually came equipped with a limited slip rear differential. Both generations featured an innovative four wheel drive system called Super Select Four Wheel Drive, which allowed for operations as a rear wheel drive only or four wheel drive with a open or closed differential in high or low range. The second generation is going to be the more rugged and ready feeling of the two, but is increasingly harder to find at all. Where people looking for something with good off-road prowess, but more stable road manners, or the need to haul more passengers, should look at the third generation. Even with its refinement, don't count the third generation out as an adventure vehicle. Back in 2004, the support crew used one to chase Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman from London, England to Magadan, Siberia when they filmed The Long Way Round. Drawbacks? Well, like I said before, this one's getting a little harder to find in America. Also, model year 2001 and 2002 third gens have been known to have some mechanical flaws. So do your research before buying one. The third gen forerunner alternative, Mitsubishi Montero Sport. Generally speaking, when most people think of a capable alternative to a third gen forerunner, the first thought that crosses their mind is either a Nissan Xterra or R50 Pathfinder. Both great vehicles and affordable and well-kept examples can be found within our budget. However, Nissan's always had a certain design language that seemed off to me. I remember the first gen Xterra being an immensely polarizing design that I don't feel has really held up that well. That's where the Mitsubishi Montero Sport comes in. The thing bears quite a resemblance to the 4Runner in shape and size as well as functionality. And like the 4Runner, it was Japanese built, body on frame, and was offered in four and six cylinder models, four wheel drive options being a true four wheel drive with low range. Sold in America from 1997 to 2004, they only featured one generation, which got a facelift and upgrade from rear leafs to coils in 2001. It does come with its share of drawbacks, however, mainly that it just wasn't as popular as the other Japanese offerings here in the United States. So aftermarket support isn't nearly as good as with a 4Runner, and it can be a little more challenging to work on in the engine department. If you buy one, do your research and ask questions. This one has an interference type timing belt, which means if the timing belt breaks, the pistons are gonna slam into the valves and you're gonna have a serious problem. So if it hasn't been done, budget for it accordingly because you're gonna to wanna to do it. For the person who just has to have a Jeep, 1993 to 1998 Jeep Grand Cherokee ZJ. So there are some people who will say we should include a Jeep in this list, and they're right. Now for overlanding, older Jeep Wranglers are probably not gonna be your best bet owing to their smaller size for handling all the equipment you might wanna bring. There's just not that much room in them. For a long time, the go-to model at this price point has been the Jeep Cherokee XJ. However, in recent years, its prices have started to go the same way as the third gen 4Runner. <sighs> Examples of which are getting hard to find at the sub 5K price range. The ones you are going to find are going to have the ever-living dog snot run out of them. However, there is another Jeep out there that is mechanically similar to an XJ, yet can be had with an old-school pushrod V8 engine. You know what I'm talking about. The Grand Cherokee ZJ. What's a ZJ? If you got ass, big man, you can't afford it. Actually, you can't afford it. I've just been waiting to put that joke in a video for quite a long time. Offered from 1993 to 1998, the Grand Cherokee was one of the last models to begin development under AMC's ownership of the Jeep Mark, before Chrysler took over and, some might argue, altered the brand for the worse. But what you get is a more refined version of the Cherokee, with the advantages of unibody construction, solid front and rear axles hanging on a quadrilink suspension, and was offered in the US with the venerable 4.0 straight six, 
or a 5.2 or 5.9 Magnum V8. With a 0 to 60 time of 6.8 seconds, the 1998 5.9 liter held the distinction of fastest production SUV for a decade before it was unseated by the SRT version of the third generation Grand Cherokee. It's also a Jeep, which means there's a robust aftermarket and you'll be able to accessorize until your heart's content. Parts are also plentiful and cheap. This model isn't without its drawbacks. Most of them are more annoying electrical gremlins than catastrophic mechanical failures, but I would stay away from the all-wheel drive models with the viscous coupler and just stick to ones with a standard two-wheel drive, four-wheel high-low transfer case. For the person who dreams of owning a Land Rover Defender, 1989 to 1998 Land Rover Discovery 1. If you're like me, every time you see a Land Rover Defender, you can't help imagining yourself on an African safari, blazing your way across the Australian outback, or mud-bogging through a malarial-infested Southeast Asian jungle. With their solid front axles and coil-sprung suspension, and Buick-derived aluminum V8, and full-time four-wheel drive with a locking center differential, they'll go places most other stock off-roaders fear to tread. There's just one issue, the price. You see, you're not gonna find any Defender that's even running for under $20,000. Totally not a budget vehicle. Enter our Land Rover Discovery Series 1. Yeah, we bought one. I know some of you out there will think we're insane, and for good reason. In the last 20 years, Land Rover's reputation for reliability has waned. But the Discovery 1's a little different. As I said before, its drivetrain is identical to that of the Defender, a vehicle that was intentionally designed with the mechanical simplicity of a farm tractor, which means when it does have an issue, it's usually a much simpler fix than contemporary vehicles. Here in America, those of us who grew up in the 90s or early 2000s might remember the Discovery as the rig your rich friend's mom picked him up from soccer practice in. But all it takes is one YouTube search of the Camel Trophy and you'll understand why it was a shame so many of these vehicles gave their best years of service being force fed a steady diet of pavement and concrete. While parts for this particular drivetrain are fairly inexpensive and plentiful, you might struggle to find them at your local Napa. Thankfully there is a robust internet parts community. There is also a well supported international aftermarket, so accessorizing isn't that hard. The real elephant in the room that would make you think twice before taking the plunge on one of these old rovers is the maintenance. None of it appears exceedingly hard, just that it's more frequent and time consuming than other vehicles out there. You might find yourself choosing to disable or not fix certain items like leaky sunroofs. The biggest single thing to watch out for, in my opinion, is the head gaskets. They appear to be a when, not if kind of item, so plan and budget accordingly. While you can get a good off-roader for a great price with a Discovery, Series 1 models can be hard to come by. There were only ever about 41,000 Discovery 1s sold in America. However, thanks to the legacy of good old British colonialism, if you find yourself somewhere in the world with a healthy cricket following, Short. Chances are you might be able to also find a Discovery. Did we make a good choice making this our second off-road vehicle? Well, only time will tell. I'm not going to lie to you. This rig does have a lot of promise, but she does have her issues. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more of this Discovery project, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. As always, I'm Matt Kester. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Frugal Explorer Dad. Until next time, be good.